this tutorial I want to discuss the subject of the timeline track structure. I talked briefly about the timeline track structure in tutorial 53, but I want to cover it in much more detail in this tutorial. It's not my intention to describe all the parameters that are available for all the different types of track. They're so numerous as to make it difficult enough to deal with over many tutorials, let alone one. For simple titles and lower thirds, tracks are structured in a basic way. We simply add a new media item, be it a spline primitive or a text item, and the track structure is built for us. However, with complex designs, a simple structure makes the task of animation and modification quite inefficient. An efficient track structure allows multiple media items to be modified or animated together saving time and a great deal of frustration. As with many things, planning your title beforehand will allow you to determine the best track structure for your project. I'm using Title Studio within Continuum 2022. Your version's UI may be different. The first thing to be aware of is that the track structure in Title Studio is hierarchical. Basically, this means that any track in the structure will dominate the track or tracks below it. That's a little simplistic, but a brief demonstration may make it clearer. You notice that, as I added the second media item, the first item added was pushed to the bottom of the structure. In this case, the colour media item dominates the text item, blocking it out. If I move the text item above the colour item, it then becomes the dominant entry. The only reason the colour shows through is that the text item has a transparent background. Track structures can range in complexity and content type. The content type will depend upon the type of media added to the track structure. To demonstrate a simple structure, I'll clear the current structure and add a single text media item. As you'll know by now, that can be done by clicking the Add New Media icon, then selecting Flat Text. This is the simplest of all structures, consisting of a scene track, a shape track and a texture track. The scene track is always the top track in a project and all other tracks are effectively encompassed within that track. This is an extremely powerful feature. Every element in a complex title can be manipulated together by modifying the scene track's parameters. Directly underneath the scene track is the shape track. This allows various parameters of a media item to be modified. For instance, if the media item is text, the colour of that text can be modified. Directly underneath the shape track is the texture track. In the case of a flat text item, which this is, some parameters available for the shape track are also available for the texture track. On the other hand, there are parameters for the texture track that aren't available for the shape track. For instance, the text window has the same parameters for both the shape and texture tracks. If I select the controls window, the shape and texture tracks have different parameters. A 
complex track structure can be defined as one with multiple media items of various types. It can also contain multiple containers, each containing multiple media items. Containers can also be nested inside other containers. As I described earlier, the top entry will be the scene container and all other entries will be encompassed within this container. I'll discuss the different types of scene container later, but before I continue, I want to mention two other types of container. These are the 3D container and the title container. For normal effects and animations, the 3D container is used. The only time you would use a title container is for effects such as credit rolls and text crawls. Unlike the scene container, these containers can be placed anywhere in the track structure. Their purpose is to isolate any media items contained within them from media items outside of them. This means that all media items contained within them can be manipulated without affecting other media items. Underneath the scene container sits the shape track, then the texture track. Depending upon the shape track media type, there will be other tracks underneath the texture track. It's important to note that all tracks under the shape track belong to the shape track, and the parameters of these tracks will have no effect on any other shape track. I now want to go through some of the different types of track. I've created a track structure with many different types of media items. This isn't a practical structure, but it allows me to describe the track entries one at a time. We'll start with the scene track. As I mentioned earlier, all entries in the track structure are encompassed within this entry. It can exist in one of two modes. The default mode, which is 2D Composite, and 3D Render. I want to leave the subject of the 3D Render mode for a future tutorial, where I'll be dealing with the three-dimensional environment. Suffice to say for now, is that using the default 2D composite container, although shapes can be three-dimensional, in relation to other shapes in the track structure, they're composited in two-dimensional space. Each mode can be shared or unshared. Unfortunately, I haven't discovered the difference between a shared project and an unshared one, so I have no explanation for this. Next comes the shape track. These tracks, by default, are usually named according to the type of media they contain. I say usually because there are exceptions. Let's look at the obvious exception in this track structure. This is the colour media entry but for some reason its default label is track. It's worth mentioning at this point that all shape track labels can be renamed. To do this, right click on the name and select Rename Track. We'll now look at one or two of the other shape track types. The label of a text shape track will contain the text string. The label for long text strings will be truncated to 16 characters.
Note that renaming this label will have no effect on the actual text string. Another type of media item is an image file. You can see that the label of this track is the name of the image file. You will also notice that the full path of the image file is displayed in the texture track timeline track. The texture track comes next. The texture track labels usually start with the word texture. Again, there are exceptions. For example, with the colour media item, the texture track label starts with the word material. The texture track defines the type of texture applied to the media item. For instance, an obvious example is the gradient shape entry which has a texture track labelled Texture Gradient. Another example is the shape track labelled DSC020027.jpg, which has a texture track label indicating the name of the image file. As you can see, the majority of media types have no track entries underneath the texture track entry. One exception to this is the entry for extruded text. This has one subentry, which itself has a subentry. Across the top of the timeline window, there are six icons. I'll deal with these one at a time, but for reasons that will become obvious shortly. I want to deal with the second one first. This icon toggles the visibility of the materials tracks. With these tracks visible, a structure that has many shape tracks can start to look a bit complicated, so I suggest that for normal use you should leave this option disabled. However, certain parameters will remain hidden when this disabled. For instance, with it enabled, there is a shader track visible, and parameters for this track are displayed in the controls window. With it disabled, this track is hidden, and so are its parameters. Back to the first icon. This toggles the visibility of transformation tracks. When enabled, that's when the icon is highlighted in blue, the transformations for all the shape track items are made visible in the track structure. That probably needs a bit more of an explanation. Shape transformations refer to all the shape parameters that are available under the Controls tab and are presented as entries under the Transformations entry for the shape. The problem here is that it doesn't happen. You can see that, although there are transformation entries, there are no parameters underneath them. For this to happen, it's necessary to enable the third icon, which is the Toggle Smart View icon. Then re-enable the Transformation View icon. These transformation entries can then be opened up to display the individual parameters, along with their values and interpolation controls, pertaining to that transformation group. For example, expanding the transformations entry for the text shape reveals four sub-entries. 
These sub-entries refer to the tabs that will show in the controlled window when that shape is selected. If I now expand the drop shadow entry, this will reveal all the parameters and their values contained within the drop shadow tab. I want to now say a few words about the toggle smart view switch. That's the third icon. The documentation states that with this enabled, the track structure will collapse and show only tracks that have had parameters changed or had keyframes applied. However, as I've just demonstrated, this is not the case. The actions of the two icons contradict the documentation. When I reported this to Boris FX, they agreed that it was a bug. Let's move on and look at the fourth icon. This is the Add New Shape Control and has seven options. The first option, One Sided Plane, simply adds the video event that has a title studio effect added to in your host to the track structure. This is useful if you wanted to include a smaller version of your video clip into your title. All the shape position parameters are available to allow full manipulation of the video clip, but further enhancement is limited. For instance, you can't apply a border, but you can apply a drop shadow. I'll just add a text media item and place it under the video clip. To make the text stand out a little, I can give it a background. To do this, I'll select the texture track of the text entry, then select the layer tab. I can now set the background colour to a suitable one. Maybe light blue. And set the opacity to 50. Now I'll switch back to the host. Don't forget to do this by clicking the apply button. The default compositing mode set by the basic title studio UI is none. To get the video clip to show, you must set the compositing mode to normal. Don't forget that if you don't like where the title is located, you don't need to go back into Title Studio UI to change it. You can click the Use Transformations checkbox and use the various parameters to maneuver it exactly where you want it.
Next in the list is the two-sided plane. It took me a while to figure out how this works, and to be honest, I'm not sure what practical use it would be. When I do find a practical use for it, I'll be sure to include it in a tutorial. Meanwhile, I'll demonstrate what I've found out. As you can see, the result is the same as the one-sided plane. Apart from the shape name being changed, there are a couple of differences. Firstly, the shape type icon has changed to indicate two sides. Secondly, a letter S has appeared at the side of the padlock icon. I don't know what this letter is short for, but what I do know is that currently the video clip will show on both sides of the plane. I can show you what I mean by using the spin Y parameter. If I click on the S, it changes to the letter M, and a second texture entry is added to the shape entry. I can then click on the first V1 entry, which will give me several options. This will allow me to replace the video clip on the front side of the plane with one of these options. For instance, I can replace it with a gradient. The next shape in the list is Extrusion. This places a rectangular spline primitive into this track structure. I talked about spline primitives in tutorial 53, so I won't go into detail here. Next comes the Sphere. This, by default, will place a sphere with a video clip superimposed onto its surface in the composite window. It can then be manipulated using the parameters in the controls window. Like the two-sided plane, the surface of the sphere can have two images. However, unlike the two-sided plane, you can't see the other side, because it's the inside of the sphere. If I select the Sphere Shape entry, then the Sphere tab in the Controls window, I can adjust the wrap value to show the inside of the sphere. Like the one-sided plane, it can also be manipulated using the basic UI in the host's UI. Next comes the cube. At first glance, this doesn't seem to do anything other than display the video clip. However, if I reduce the master scale, then use the spin and tumble controls, you can see that it is indeed a cube with a video clip superimposed onto its side. 
As with the two-sided plane, there is a letter S at the side of the padlock. If I click this, it changes to a letter M and a further five texture entries are created, making six in all. Now, you notice that nothing's really changed, but there is a problem now. If I rotate the cube now, it doesn't look right. The sides of the cube aren't interacting with each other as they would in the real world. This is because, by default, the scene is composited in two-dimensional space and it can't make sense of the three-dimensional movement of the six sides of the cube. This can be rectified and I'll show you how, but as mentioned earlier I don't want to go into detail about the three-dimensional environment as that's the subject of a future tutorial. To rectify the situation, I need to change the scene container to 3D render. I can now rotate the cube and it will behave as it should do. I can now replace one or more of the texture entries as I described with the two-sided plane. We now come to the cylinder. As with the sphere, this results in the video clip being superimposed onto the surface of the cylinder. Rotating the cylinder shows that it's hollow, with a video clip on both sides. Clicking the S at the side of the padlock will add another texture entry. Changing the track media for one of these entries will change one of the cylinder sides to that track media. Next comes Imported Model. This allows the import of Cinema 4D, 3D Studio or .obj files. I can ignore the error message. It's just telling me that there isn't a valid materials element in this file. The image can be manipulated as usual using the parameters in the control window. You can also apply one of the many material styles to the image.
The next icon is the now familiar Add New Media icon. Selecting this opens a list of available media items that can be added. I've dealt with a number of the options in this list in several previous tutorials, so you'll forgive me if I don't go into too much detail. Flat text. This is the text item you'll choose for standard lower third text. Flat text with 3D lights. This is for text strings that interact with the lights configured in the scene container. If I move the text forward using the position Z parameter, the text ceases to be illuminated by the default light. Extruded text. I've dealt with this before. Extruded type on text. I haven't dealt with this before and as I intend this to be a subject of a future tutorial I won't say too much about it here. I'll just explain what's going on in the track structure. Firstly you may notice that the scene container isn't the default 2D composite container. It's called a title container and I mentioned this type earlier in this tutorial. You'll use this type when creating special effects such as credit rolls and text scrolls. Because I've added the extruded type on media, the title container has been added automatically. You can see that each character in the text string has its own entry under the shape entry and the timeline tracks have been populated with keyframes. Without me doing anything special, I've created a text string that literally types on. Now with the scene entry selected you can see that there are a number of parameters under the animation tab that allow the animation to be changed in a number of ways. Credit roll. I dealt with this entry in tutorial 58 so please refer to that tutorial for details. Spline Object and Spline Primitive. These were covered in Tutorial 53. EPS File. You use this for inserting a file created with Adobe Illustrator. Image File. Self-explanatory. Used for inserting various types of images. 3D Model File. Used for inserting compatible 3D objects. I demonstrated this earlier on in this tutorial. Composition file. This is used to insert a saved Title Studio project file. Note that it will be inserted without deleting any of the track entries. Colour and Gradient, self-explanatory. Video 1. Inserting this will show the video that has the title studio effect applied in the NLE.
The sixth icon allows a new container to be added. The two options available have already been discussed earlier. In this section, I want to deal briefly with the various icons that appear at the side of the track entries. First, the eye icon. This appears for every track item and allows that particular track to be hidden. This is useful when building a complex track structure. Shapes can be hidden so that other shapes can be configured without distraction. Next, the padlock. As will be obvious, locking this will prevent any parameters for the associated shape being changed. Now the folder icon. This simply indicates that it's a container. The blue one indicates a scene container. A normal one such as this indicates a 3D container. And a folder with a letter T superimposed indicates a title container. A rectangle indicates a one-sided plane, whilst a rectangle with a corner turned over indicates a two-sided plane. An extrusion of any kind is represented by a white circle with a black inner circle. A 3D model is represented by a mesh object. Any shape item can be changed into a different shape by clicking this icon and selecting a new shape. The icons down the right side of the track structure define the types of shape track entries. Clicking on one of these allows the type of media item for that shape to be changed. Finally, I want to talk briefly about the nesting of containers. As I mentioned earlier, a track structure can consist of multiple containers, each containing multiple media items. Some of these containers can be nested inside other containers that themselves contain media items. This is an extremely powerful feature of Title Studio. To demonstrate how this works, I've loaded a track structure that consists of nests. 
It's not a complex nested structure, but it'll give you an idea of how it works. I have three 3D containers, each container consisting of another container along with a text label. You can see from the structure that each container is nested inside another container. So, if I select the primary container entry and use the Translate Interactor, I can move these three labels in unison. If I select the next container down, I can move the labels for nest 2 and 3 without disturbing the label for nest 1. Similarly, if I select the final container, I can move the label for nest 3 without disturbing the other labels. With careful planning, complex structures can be created such that the animation of a group of tracks doesn't affect the animation of another group of tracks. So, that's your complete guide to Title Studio's timeline track structure. It's unfortunate that it's been a lengthy tutorial, but as you've seen, there was a lot to cover. Thanks for staying with me, and if you found it useful, please consider subscribing, if you haven't already done so. Join me next time when I'll be exploring the three-dimensional environment. Until then, bye for now.